what? It's the ill pandemic. Whoa. It's got no relation, man, because we ain't got no limits, yeah? Limits, yeah? Should it all drop from the beginning? Yo, you can Hello, everyone, and we're back with Hero Talk. I'm host and creator of Healing Heroes, Christopher Rangio, and I hope you're ready to have a relaxing weekend. I had a relaxing week. I went up to Maine on vacation for four days with my cousin. Saw my grandmother. It was really nice. It wasn't brutally hot up there, as I uh, was anticipating. But it was nice. It's a nice little getaway before the summer ends. Can't really complain. Um, I'm really excited, though, about this episode. Um, I was excited before I recorded it. And after I recorded it, it was just as the excitement was still there. Um, I got to interview Ryan O'Regan. He portrayed Captain Cornelius in the Proof of Concept, for those who've seen it. Um, wow. Talking to this guy, he really knows a lot about comedy. Uh, you could tell that he's very passionate about comedy. Um, he's done stuff, you know, he's done stand-up before. He's um, been in short films. He's been in a few features, whether it's a cameo or a supporting role. Um, and I believe two of his projects, one of them called Trip, is an award-winning short film. And um, his other short film, Sunday's Best, was multi-nominated. So let's just get right into this episode. Um, because I want your virgin little ears to hear the magic we made. Not really magic, but you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, here's episode two of Hero Talk. The music featured in our episode today is from the artist Coyote. That's K-A-I period O-T-I. His Instagram and SoundCloud are both at Coyote. And if you have a band camp, go follow him at K-A-I dash O-T-I bandcamp.com oh and also if you have not yet followed healing heroes on instagram or twitter yet yeah you should go do that it's healing heroes underscore for both twitter and instagram what's going on so uh i appreciate you doing this as always um when was the last time i i don't know last time i saw you i think we did a promo at your apartment yeah that probably would have been the uh, promo cut of uh, captain cornelius you know, exercising, as it were, yeah. if you can call it that. <laughs> exercising and drinking the beer. So, what have you been up to since then? Uh, uh, just a couple of, um, I guess, comedic shorts for this person, that person up in the city. Uh, nothing too major because now it's that summertime season, and I have to get money. You know, yeah. and <laughs> when you work at a movie theater and you bartend other places, you have to focus on that. This is like my peak season. Let me work now act in the fall in the fall that seems to be the main thing even trying to do anything during the summertime is like everyone's on vacation or everyone's working like you said well it's not just that it's just con harsh conditions for a lot of filmmakers you know a lot of people are going on vacation so timing becomes an issue definitely and it's one of those things where it's like okay so i'm not going to get a lot of acting work unless there's something that's filming now for the fall season. Exactly. And who really wants to film with 100 degree weather out, you know? Right, no. I mean, a lot of the best shows <laughs> I've seen, they always seem to fall. Freezing weather. Yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. they, they want you in that coat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of people who haven't, you know, who haven't been following us. If you haven't been following us, Ryan did play Captain Cornelius. One thing they, it is, which is consistent is that they love how funny you were and just how animated you were. I guess let's kind of talk about like the process that went into like you kind of creating this character. There was so much depth, but we didn't really get to venture into it too much in the 10 minute proof of concept. Well, that's the thing. Like when you were telling me about what this guy was, and I know we had that conversation that one day at Starbucks, yeah, 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 yeah. which was a long conversation. It was. Uh, just trying to get a handle on what this guy was going to be and what he was. Uh, I, I, it's, it's a similar story, and yet it's not so similar, because it's one of those things that has probably been touched on whenever you've had a washed-up hero, and there's always, like, the fall from grace. If I, all the reasons why and what makes them start out, it's always different. Exactly. In my mind, I always saw Cornelius, and I think we touched on this even when I was going into, okay, how did he even get his name? Because Cornelius, aside from Planet of the Apes, no one ever hears that name. Yeah. And the only other reference I had for that was he's a character in the Bible. And now, I'm not a born-again anything. I'm exactly. not very religious. But the fact that this guy was, like, you know, a gladiator in the Bible. You know, he was a warrior. You know, that's something that 
made me think, okay, well, this guy probably comes from a humble background. This is a hero that he looked up to mm -hmm. and wanted to be, like, you know, simple and plain and just went ahead and did the job. And that's really when you look at what the background of Cornelius will eventually be if this thing goes forward, when this thing goes when forward. When this thing, yeah. Always <laughs> when, when, yeah, when, when. When this thing goes forward, you'd see that he comes from, like, that honest-to-goodness beginning, and it gets corrupted, and... That's how he ends up the person he is. He's a corrupted soul who's fallen from the heights of where he was. And you added a lot to it, too. You, uh, even th our first meeting in Starbucks where you said, you, you, you were like, I'm thinking merchandise for this guy in the sense, or yeah. like, uh, in the sense of like, uh, in the, in the original proof of concept, we had a scene where you were online for hot dogs where, and this kid was there and, then and, saw and, and the had a t-shirt and had your t-shirt and then the mother was you know like he's a really big fan or she's a big fan and you were you kept calling the kid it um but like it was an ugly child yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, captain cornelius doesn't bullshit anybody <laughs> not anymore no no, no no but no but that was a really good thing you're like you know if these kids are wearing my t-shirts i must be getting some like i must be getting most of the royalties from it and then that's where we branched off to like in in the healing heroes world there's a TV show about Captain Cornelius and Blue Jacket, mm -hmm. which I'm trying to add into the pilot uh, episode I'm at, like I'm writing, and I would just like love to write that. And you added so much. You're like, I think if this guy is really stuck in the mid '90s or late '80s, what have you, he still has a box set TV, and he still has all these things. So like that was really something. Yeah. I'm glad you just you really just created the whole world for Captain Cornelius more than I ever did. So. Well, I mean, this is still your thing. I mean, don't get it twisted. Without no, no, I know, but like you, at you, you, I was like, hey, here's Captain Cornelius, here's this, here's this, but you kind of connected the dots, if that makes sense. Well, I feel like if I'm going to be this person for more than just a day, yeah. you know, I want to know exactly where I'm coming from and what I'm doing. And yeah. I mean, when I've done my own projects, I've taken at least enough time, I've taken at least a day per character just to think about what I would write for them. If I'm home and I'm in my apartment and I'm just by myself and I'm walking around and I'm just living, and yet I still have this writing to do for this person, I'll do as they would, I think as they would, I talk as they would. I, I try to be that person for the rest of the day so that this way I feel a little more comfortable in their action and reaction towards everybody else and what I'm writing. This way it doesn't seem like it's hacky or yeah. I'm just taking from something else. I'm giving as much of an honest reaction for that person as possible. And Cornelius is in the same vein. As an actor, do you find yourself more often than not like going to like a shop right and being like, I'm going to act like this guy here? You know, like, <laughs> like when you're out in public and people don't really know you, do you act it out instead of just being in your living room? Like, is that like a, a technique you would say you do as an actor or? Sometimes. It depends on the role itself like if it's something that's far and away from who I normally am then yeah I'm definitely going to need the time in the general public to get the feel about what's going to be uh, you know proper for that person or not like I don't want to go to a supermarket and say you know in two weeks I've got to play some sort of like uh, player or pimp or something you know yeah. I gotta be flirtatious I gotta be smooth I'm not gonna go and you know just chat up somebody like Hi, how you doing? What's yeah. new? You know, no, I'm gonna try to spit game to the person, which is something I normally don't do. Exactly. Okay. You know, I gotta try to get the smooth on. So yeah. this way, it's yeah. like once I'm ready for that role, it'll come off naturally, and we don't yeah. have to worry about take after take after take trying to get it right and wasting time and wasting effort and getting confused about what it is I'm trying to do in that scene. Okay. It'll be as natural flowing for me as if I, that's who I am day after day. Nice. Okay. And you're. Uh would you say you're strong suit or like are you a big comedy fan I'm assuming or absolutely before yeah. I met you I heard <laughs> about you through needy and about how you, you which did. is always good too. yeah yeah how it's like I heard about you from this woman it's like oh Jesus all right <laughs> what did she say well, this what, time? which jail yeah. sentence was this I'm yeah. not even sure <laughs> but no you uh tell us a little bit back I guess about your comedy background um well I mean I don't want to say I've like been a student of the game or anything, but I've always been more of a fan of comedy than anything else. Uh, more so than sci-fi, more so than action, more so than drama, more so than horror. And I think that's just been my upbringing. Like, as far as I can remember, I, as a little kid, I was always a fan of Disney, and Disney is usually more of a, 
a humorous yeah. movie than anything else, especially in like the late eighties, early nineties when you had things like Oliver and Company and Little Mermaid and uh, Aladdin, which is probably my favorite. Uh, I was watching a, a, a Robin Williams like documentary the other oh, day, yeah. and they were talking about. I guess I didn't even know this. Like that, this was like one of the first times like an animated movie had like an A list celebrity mm-hmm. do a voice. So that was probably right there in itself. That's that's groundbreaking. I mean, not taking away from Billy Joel and Bette Midler and Oliver and Company, but true, still. True, true, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. But there are no Robin Williams when it comes to... No, I mean, as far as, as far as a musical is concerned, yeah. and most of Disney was a musical back yeah. then. Not so much as much anymore, but yeah. back then, everything was a musical, so you always had to have that musical inclination. You always had to have those music stars. Yeah. Robin Williams was not a music star. Not at all. By any sense of the imagination. So for him to be as wired as he was, that's great. Didn't he do Fern Gully too? Wasn't he the? Well, he did the first Fern Gully. Not he did the first Fern Gully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Two as in T O O. T O O. Yeah. <laughs> not, 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 not that piece too. of crap that they put on direct to DVD. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. So he, it's really it was really interesting to see that. Now I feel like you know I didn't see Lego Movie, and you oh, had, right. and just you had like Chris Pratt, Will Arnett, Allison Brie. The names went on. I'm sure there's more names. I'm. I'm not remembering off the top of my Morgan head. Morgan Freeman, who puts himself in everything nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's pretty interesting. It, I think that's pretty interesting. So, do you, I, I, the first clip I ever saw of you, uh, going back to Needy, I was editing her documentary, and you were doing a, you do stand-up comedy. Mm-hmm. How, uh, have you done that how many years now? Well, I mean, I can't say that I've done it consistently. Okay. Uh, I've actually been, it's been quite a few years since I've done it. Uh, there's a story within that last time I did it that uh, you could share if you want to. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> I had only been doing it for a couple of years up until that point. Um, this was back in 2012, and I had been doing it since uh, I guess you'd say 2009. On and up off. Up to that point, on and off. Okay. Uh, not, I wasn't able to go every single weekend, but yeah. whenever there was an open mic or if somebody needed me to come fill in a spot or be a host or something like that. How was your first time doing it? Uh, the first time was actually like many of the other times that followed. There was a nervous energy, and I got the first few jokes off right, but the thing is, usually when I ended up performing at the beginning, it was usually towards the end of the night. Okay. So, while the room may have been like 40, 50 people strong, and everyone was out there for a particular stand-up because it's bringers, and if you don't know anything about bringers, it's that... The only time you get up on stage is if you bring enough people to the club to spend money so that this way they'll give you the stage time. Oh, okay. I didn't even know about that. It's one of the most evil things that is done in comedy because really that's just saying, okay, these people aren't necessarily going to find you funny, but they're going to root for you because they know who you are and they're your yeah. friends and your family and everything. That's so a good point. It's, a, it's kind of it's a, tough. It's it's like, a false positive. Exactly. And it's like uh, I, I, the one thing I can try and maybe relate it to is like, when you do a project and then like your mother and or my mom and dad are like you're awesome like yeah you did well and then you're like did i, I have to say this i'm a good story <laughs> yeah but then you put it out in the real world and like man this fucking sucks like but so, yeah in regards to saying the stand-up yeah so by the time i would finally get up even if i did bring them people it was only like a fraction of what everyone else brought so i was at the end of the night okay and by then, most people had gone, or they were tired, and they were just laughing at anything. And, you know, I rattled off a few quick ones in the uh-huh. beginning to get people rolling, but the silence can kill somebody mentally. Really? Yeah. Like, if you go ahead and you drop a joke and there is no reaction, at least if they booed or they tried to heckle you, that gives you something from the audience to work off of. And, and you know, depending on your skill set, you can fire back and you can bring them back on your side. But when they're silent... It's the equivalent of, like, talking to a girl, and she responds and texts you with just an LOL. Oh, yeah. You've got nowhere to go after that. And yeah, it's like, you really Okay, are don't. you, you going to give me anything else? Do I have to say something? I, I, what, what, what's, come on! And you, you're just done, and you're stammering, and you're struggling, and you don't know where to go from there on stage, and you are on stage by yourself, even if it's just five, seven people in the audience, but they're all staring at you. It's like, okay, so what are you going to do next? It's like, I don't know. What do you want? And... Uh-huh. It, it was evil. I, I tried stand up twice, and <laughs> both times I, I completely failed. Uh, not to drop names, but when I was still doing the uh, open mic nights, I actually ended up 
having a night where Rich Voss and Bonnie McFarlane, uh, which if you're in New Jersey and you know comedy, you know these people. Okay. You know, they're like the, they're like the first couple of comedy in Jersey. Uh-huh. Bonnie has been doing great work. She actually had a movie put out on Netflix. Rich Voss is just one of those guys that if you know stand-up in the tri-state area, you know his face, you know his voice. He's a, he was a finalist on uh, Last Comic Standing back in the day. You know, they and they've been together for quite some time, so for a comedy duo, two comics, two to be together for that long, it's unheard of. And I actually got some good advice from Bonnie one night, and the advice is, the audience doesn't know shit. Plain and simple. If you're going to go ahead and do comedy, or if you're going to go do it, then do any kind of project, the audience doesn't know shit. Because they don't the know what you're thinking. In the sense of what? In the sense of... Don't try to do something tailored to the audience. Do your own jokes. Do your own stand-up. Do your own image. Do your own thing. Do and say what you want. And the people that like it will follow. Don't try to necessarily shoehorn yourself into a particular subsect or don't try to do jokes that you know work with other people. Do what you want to talk about. Because they don't know much better anyway. If they did, they'd be up on stage too. And I think with something like that happening, it was a real booster. It kept me going. And it kept me experimenting, kept me being creative. Because really, it's not like I wanted to be a stand-up for the rest of my life. But since I wasn't acting at that time, it gave me an outlet. It gave me something to work with in order to hone my uh, comedic sense of humor, to improve my timing, to improve my confidence while performing. Now, when when they said that the the audience doesn't know shit, and I kind of... I like that they say that because now I feel like it falls under like how everything is PC now. Like Jerry Seinfeld says he won't perform at colleges because they're so politically correct. Well, and I think that's yeah. what he's kind of saying. And, and I think that's great advice for anything. You make something for you. Mm-hmm. You can make something for your friends. You know, you could dedicate it to your, you know, a lost one or whatever. But like at the end of the day, you're making it for you. Not everyone's going to like your stuff. So I think that not, not just in comedy, but like. In any form of art, I think that's great advice. Right. So now what you create, that is your thing. How you market it is another. Is where you want to try to think about other people. Yeah. But never try to just tailor something to what you think the audience will like. Awesome. Uh, of course, that leads me to the story about why I stopped doing stand-up. Um, it was back around, I believe, March of 2012. And I had been asked to do a stand-up set, a whole half-hour set, which is actually pretty good for a guy in my standing. And I was doing it for my friend Kelly's uh, multiple sclerosis benefit, okay. which she did uh, annually for a couple of years prior. So she had a good amount of people coming to this thing. And I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm very honored that you'd go ahead and you'd give me a shot. And, you know, I'll go ahead, I'll bust out everything I can. Because I had a whole half-hour. Yeah. Normally a good said is maybe seven to ten minutes whenever you're doing stand-up. And it feels like a half hour, I bet. Yeah, so, I mean, you're, you want to pull out every single gun you have if yeah. you can. And at the time, I wasn't exactly the most PC person in the world, especially, I'd say I worked blue. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, I couldn't really say things to certain people. I'd have to color it up. So if I'm going to be on stage, I'm laying it all out. I'm yeah. giving every single S word, F word, C word. Uh, there's a Q word, I'm sure, that I haven't even touched on. But I get to the event, and I'm all psyched, and I'm ready to do it. And I see all these little kids running around. And I'm like, okay, was there something for the kids earlier? Yeah. And then apparently there was, like, a cheerleading group or whatever. And I guess some mothers had brought their young kids, like, three, five, seven-year-olds. And I ask her, are they staying? She's like, yes. I'm like, did you know this? She's like, no. Uh, Okay. What do I do? It's like, go do your thing. It shouldn't be a problem. But I then had a mother come up and be like, so, yeah, I I know we weren't intending on having the kids. Would it be possible for you to color things up, you know, to, you know, tone it down a bit? Part of my instinct says, no, that's not how I do things. However, knowing that this was a friend's benefit and this is, something that was really meaningful to her, and it was still young in its infancy, where that many years it had been done, I didn't want to be known as the guy that was, like, turning people away from the benefit. Exactly. That's I didn't a lot, want to do that to her. Yeah, that's a lot to put on your shoulders either way, like, it, to switch up your act, like... 
if it had been a complete stranger, I probably wouldn't have given a damn. Exactly. But this was somebody I was friends with, somebody I gave a damn about. So I go ahead and I start off as best I can. And once I got into the more rude stuff, I tried to color it up and I lost it. I just went blank. There was no proper way for me to say things. I was stammering again. It was as if I was on my first open mic all over again. Shit. And instead of having only five minutes to work with, I had a, a half hour. Half hour. Well, mind you, there is a video of this event, and I've taken at least a good five, six minutes that yeah. was there, and I have posted that up. So okay. that's still a good five, six minutes. But then you're talking about a whole nother 25, where it's that LOL text again. It's that silence, and you just... You fall so flat, and it kills you. And yeah. mind you, here's the messed up part. Since that event, I have gone back to that event as a guest, not as a performer. And people still ask me to do stand-up because they thought I, that I, they liked it. They thought I was good. But every time I've tried, I just I get the shivers. I, I, I can't <laughs> do that again. And I really should. Because since then, I've done so much more in acting, in film, in producing, I've done much more than stand up. Exactly. I've done what I've started to do. So stand up should really be nothing at this point. I'm not going to say I'm a, a professional stand up comic, but I shouldn't be bad at doing five to ten minutes on stage. But this is what leads me to Cornelius. Okay. Because, again, one bad incident and it's fucked with him for years. That was one thing I, I, I really want this to come across like he and you. You portrayed it so well. Like when I first wrote it, I wanted it to be like a comedy, like knee slapping comedy. And it came off for me, little things you did were funny, like biting the hot dog after you said you want to change your old ways. And but that scene was really intense when you were like, you know, I I, I, I didn't just lose a sidekick, I lost my best friend. Like that really I think puts into perspective like maybe someone can kind of just be in your shoes. Yeah, we're we're playing dress up with superheroes and stuff, but like it, it, it could touch into reality. So that's why, for me, that's why I liked having superheroes go to therapy. But in this case, in the story, you and Dr. Connors had a history. So he, he knew everything. That's why you could have gone back to him. And, and Right, it was a familiar place. It was a comfortable place. And That was the thing of you taking the mask down, too. You Because normally I wouldn't, obviously. No, so it was really interesting. M one of my favorite scenes is the hallway scene. I know, <laughs> like, it's very... I know, I don't know why, it's just that... <laughs> It's more than two actors inter interacting, and it's like, you know, a, a, someone seeing your idol, like, you get starstruck. What do you like about that scene? I think the takeaway is that you get to see him as he is with everybody else. Uh, the, the difference about the proof of concept and what we had worked up is that we got to see two sides of Cornelius. We got to see him vulnerable with Dr. Connors, but then all the stuff that led up to it with the hot dog and the kids and exactly, all that, yeah. we got to see how he was in the general public. And really in the proof of concept, the only time we get to see him in the general public is that hallway scene. So you get to see the Cornelius that the masses see. That everyone sees. Yeah, everyone you get to knows. see the sarcastic, you get to see the more uh, you know, direct and unapproachable yeah. Yeah. person. You are the most vulnerable and most honest when you're with Dr. Connors. So that that's a uh, that's a really good good point. Um, how how was it for you working with Mark? Because I know you only I think you met him the week before at table read. <laughs> yeah, pretty it was much. a it was a struggle to get everyone together. But I, you know, I, I'm not just saying it. But I, I really enjoyed your I enjoyed everyone's chemistry. Uh, but I, I I really enjoyed that scene. That's the bulk of the proof of concept. So how was it acting with him, well, alongside him? I should say. I mean, I really have to say that I was surprised by Mark because even from the table read you got to see that he wasn't just uh, you know this professional actor you know he wasn't just this guy who's been doing stage for you know however long he's been doing it who's been doing projects longer than I've been doing projects you know yeah I mean he's a weather professional for sure but even the table read you got to see that he's able to be one of those guys that can just roll with the punches He's one of those ones that can just throw out a joke as necessary as anybody else needs to. Yeah. And I found that uplifting because at least from what I could gather from the other stuff that you had shot and what you had promoted and what you had written for everybody, I felt like the comedy relief, but it was nice to know that other people had a sense of comedy. Mark is somebody that 
he has enough of that timing and he knows he has enough of that expertise that he can play the straight man yeah so well and set me up as good as he does <laughs> yeah and he did set you up a lot and you i know, thought that I, was I, great I, I feel like we have that like abner costello sort of uh you know, working relationship. Yeah. You know, but even though Abbott was the straight guy, he still had to have the same kind of sense and comedy timing. And the timing, exactly. In order to make it all work. Mark, with me, that works. Who are some of your um, comedy idols? Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks, I love his stuff because he can just do something so tongue-in-cheek. I watched Blazing Saddles you the could. other day, and it was just like, you can't make something like that now, you know? Like... I mean, you could, but, but I just think that if somebody tried to make it now, it would be so lowbrow. But though, but it, the thing is, when I first watched it, I was like, man, we're, and I was young when I watched it, and I was like, wow, are they really serious? Isn't that? And my, I remember I watched it with my mom and stepdad. They're like, no, like they're they're making like he's he's great at making fun of stuff, and and, and Bla I feel like Blazing Saddles was one where he just completely just like. Well, mocked I'm sure everything. Pryor had that help in there, Yes, of yeah, 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 of which course. A lot of people don't give a credit enough too. But. People, I don't. Do you think enough people know, like that he helped write it? That Richard Pryor helped write Blazing Saddles. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people know Again, that. Richard Pryor helped <laughs> write Blazing Saddles. I there repeat. was a black man in this movie. There was a black man behind the movie. I know we touched on Robin Williams earlier, but <laughs> when Robin Williams passed away, that was that was extremely rough for me, and I couldn't even. I don't even know what I would do. If Jim, if anything happened to Jim Carrey, because the work Jim Carrey puts in, like, I, for one, I know it's not, this isn't really talking about comedy, but like, he makes a lot of good dramatic pieces too. Oh yeah. You know, like he's a really f overall fun actor, but Eternal he, Sunshine alone. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So many people. That too. Like, if you're a person that loves movies, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is, in some people's minds, as close to a perfectly executed film as you can get. You know, from Ace Ventura 1 and 2 to The Mask <laughs> to, he was on In Living Color back in the day with Fire Marshal Bill, like. It was weird because, again, with my upbringing and everything, you know, I didn't really have a father figure to latch on to, someone to teach me what was funny, what wasn't. Yeah. So my first instances of humor outside of cartoons was Box 5, which uh, was just premiering at that time in the late 80s. So I got to see things like The Simpsons, Married with Children, In Living Color. Yeah. And In Living Color, you had Jim Carrey, who created all these weird, almost cartoonish characters. So he was probably the one person. Him and I think maybe uh, Damon Wayans were the two people I really latched onto from that show. And then you go ahead and you st see that guy from the small screen, and all of a sudden, he's got commercials for a movie that's going to be out in theaters. Theaters where the only time you go to the theaters when you're a little kid is because Disney put out a new animated film. Yeah. Or you try to sneak into an R-rated movie and get <laughs> kicked out. So I so wanted to see that movie. I wanted to see Ace Ventura so bad as a kid. And when I finally saw it, I was surprised because it was so much like his characters and everything on In Living Color. And he was able to just throw it up to the big screen. I want to be able to go into reactions yeah. from people. As I think he, he I think he, I think that, I don't, I might be wrong, this is just an observation of me, I think that is his, like, not sole purpose in acting, but, like, he, I think he does things for reactions, like, yeah. like most people, but he, he is a true sense of the word entertainer. Yes. He is a great entertainer. He, you just see him, like, just even little things, like, when, when David Letterman retired, he did the top ten, and he brought out everyone, and Jim Carrey's like, Dave, I think you're a bit of an over uh, an over actor, and like just like that moment, like if no one ever saw Jim Carrey, that moment kind of just embodied who he was, and he just he just seems like he just loves to have fun, and he he legit seems like he enjoys it. So that that's someone I think that's any if you're if if you like comedy, I feel like you need to like study if the you're dude. Just like putting a smile on someone's face. Yeah, he is the guy. He's the guy for that's sure. That's someone to look to. And yeah, I always have. So um. Besides the uncomfortable costume you had to wear, it's gotten more comfortable. It's, gotten more I good. Say. it's easier for me to get in and out of yeah. as opposed to that first day. That first day, I'm sure. What were some of the difficulties you th you had to deal with? You think was it? If there were any, I'm sure there were. Like there was difficulties from my end too. But like I just want, as an actor standpoint, what what did you find kind of challenging? Um. 
I think the most challenging thing for me, which is probably the most challenging thing for any role that I'm doing that wasn't something that I wrote, is just sticking to the script. Because my mind just goes all over the place, and I, I have more fun just ad-libbing and being reactionary as opposed to sticking to the script. And I, I, knew, I need to be better about that, but it's just in the past few years that I've really had an acting career since like from 2013 on, uh -huh. people like the random shit I've had to say, and they've used it. So it's hard for me to go ahead and be like, okay, what you've written here is good, can we also try this? I'm learning too, as myself, like, I want, I want my actors to like feel comfortable and say what they would say instead of what I might have written. But so you still like, want to stick it along but I still want line. along that line. Exactly, yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm usually very open to like, if an actor wants to try and say something different. I remember one, I, I remember one specific scene where, uh, Dr. Connors. It didn't make the final cut, unfortunately. But Dr. Connors takes those hot dogs from you. We did like three takes, and I was like, just come up with whatever. And you came up with some funny shit. You're in that mindset where like, man, I can ad lib this shit. Like I've I've studied it enough. I've done it enough. Like, let you know. So I can see that being a challenge for you as well. Like like you said. So right. I, mean, I think when it's drama, I stick more to the script than anything. Okay. Else yeah. Because with drama, when you have to be angry or sad or morose, you know, for a lot of comics, or at least a lot of people that are comedically minded. Yeah. They're always miserable. They're always, there's always something in the back of their head that's just making them want to, you know, curse or drink or do something, you know, against the norm that's not PC. So I think for that, like, a, a lot of comics could do drama easily because then they would just be themselves. And when I'm doing that's drama, really when I'm doing something that dramatic, I just think, okay, if this was happening to me in real life, how would I react? Yeah. Now, push it up a little bit to make it more of just mopey. Yeah. And you're there. Do you find yourself, you know, because what you just said is extremely interesting. It has me thinking, like, you have these comedians, and I'm going back to kind of, I guess, like Jim Carrey and Owen Wilson, where, the, you know, they, they, and even Robin Williams, they dealt with depression. And mm -hmm. everyone thinks because you're funny, you have to ha put on this facade that, like, you're the one to make people laugh. Do you ever feel like when you're hanging with people or you're at work or something like that and you don't feel like being funny and you're and you're not like you're like like upbeat self do you do you hear people say what's wrong with you man or like and I think everyone I think there's a lot of people out there that assume that you know just because someone can crack a joke that they should always crack a joke. And while for some people it may be easier than others there's those people that you know, if something's really biting at them, if something's really getting to them, they're not going to be funny and they're not going to be happy until they get themselves out of it. There's nothing you can say or do. Exactly. So it makes it very hard to portray that happy, smiley, Always be on, yeah. But that's why people who are so good at it, people who are comedic, so, someone like Robin Williams, someone like Jim Carrey, uh, I'd say even somebody like Kevin Hart, even though it doesn't seem like he has any problems or any Yeah, I'm though. sure he does. Absolutely. Everyone does. That's why I like... I he probably got a Napoleon complex with as short as his ass <laughs> is, but yeah. let it show. If anything, he'll exactly. make fun of it in order to deal. Exactly. And I, I haven't watched the show Louie. Oh, God, Louis C.K. But I the guy that holds it on the sleeve. I always like seeing comedians do, like, more dramatic pieces. Like, I, I watched a movie recently, uh, The Fundamentals of Caring. It's oh, a Netflix, Netflix original. Yeah, 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 yeah with uh, Paul Rudd. A, yeah. mm -hmm. And it, he's his Paul Rudd self, but, like... It's a movie where he, he loses his child, and he, he, you find that out through the movie, like from the beginning until, you know, the end, but like, he has this one scene where it's like, wow, I've never seen him that, like, intense before, you know, like, <laughs> you saw him be a, 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 a wonderful asshole in, like, Ant-Man and other movies, but like, this is the first movie I've seen him really, like, serious, and I, I always find it interesting that, that, that when comedians kind of just venture off once in a blue moon to more serious stuff. I've I asked I'm gonna be asking everyone this. Uh, Go ahead. What uh? I don't want to feel different. What what um? What do you hope to get out of healing heroes? That's the hard question because. And he, or even if what do you want for Captain Cornelius? Oh. Well, in the story I mean, and that but like what for the project in general anything from the project what would you like to see happen? Well, as far as Captain Cornelius and his arc, 
Um, I would hope that he at least gets a full rounded story. You know, obviously there'll be mentions of his history when he was in his prime and all of that. And I'd like to see a road to redemption. I'd like to see him climb up to some height again. But then I also want to see it end. Um, only because I don't want a character with that much on his plate to have to struggle for much longer. Right. I would hope that whatever arc, whatever his story is, I would hope it does eventually have an end. Because it feels like he's worked his way towards one. That's interesting to hear from the guy who is portrayed. <laughs> well, yeah, I, so. I never think that there's a, a an actor who's bigger than the role. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that say this that you know if you go ahead and you take any role, you know you can practically put anybody in the role, and as long as they do a good job, it's fine. Like Iron Man could have been portrayed by a woman, or Captain America could have been portrayed by a black guy. Yeah. Or, you know, the Hulk could have been a fat Bruce Banner. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really matter as long as the job gets done. Mm -hmm. Because no one is bigger than the role. And I feel that with Cornelius being almost like the crux of this series, where, you know, everything revolves around him, but it doesn't. But it doesn't, his mind. Yeah. It's, it's all got to, you know, start with him, end with him to some degree. So if he doesn't have like a full round rounded story and if it doesn't end with him to some degree, it just feels like it could trail off anywhere. And I think whenever the story of Healing Heroes is done and told, it's gotta be with him, uh, unfortunately. Uh, even if it's at a bad point because yeah. he's the one that kicked it all off. Um, not, not that I'm swaying you in one direction. No, 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 no. I do know. There's it's so many. I, I, I kind of think back to um, another show that just recently ended abruptly, uh, Penny Dreadful. Never got it. into it, no. Oh, it was great. It wasn't? Okay. And the main three seasons were a cast of different characters with all kinds of actors from Josh Hartnett to... Um, Eva Green, wasn't she? Eva it? Green. Yeah. Ava. Ava. All right. Ava's character that everything was revolving around. It was her descent and her trying to balance the dark and the light in herself. And again, spoiler alert if you haven't watched the end of it, even though it was months ago, she dies. Okay. Now, the other characters, they have things going on. There are stories that could have been expanded upon, but the creator of the series said everything pretty much revolved around her. Once she died, to continue on and bring in, say, new characters to fill the void or to work with the ones that had been introduced in the third series and to expand upon the stories that these other people were doing, it almost didn't make any sense. It did a disjust and it would do an injustice to the character of Eva Green and who she portrayed and what she went through. I'm actually noticing that a lot lately, too. Um, like, one of my favorite shows, Marin. Okay. Four seasons. Like, it... it it, it, it was just four seasons, and I, I don't want to be like, oh, that's it, but it's like, I feel like one, in his mind, the story was over. Yeah. And that was it. Same with, like, a, a Breaking Bad. Everyone thought, like, oh, let's go to, t do do a Dexter, go to eight seasons. No, like, six no, seasons is started. it. Because even in the latest seasons of Dexter, when even with the series finale of Dexter. Oh, uh, fucking Dexter just, ruined you, everything for you me. You start like, dragging it out to a point where exactly. you lose interest. Dexter should have ended after a, a season five or season six. Right. After the John Lithgow season, should have done maybe one or two more seasons. But it shouldn't have dragged out to eight. And I completely agree. And that, I think that's, uh, you don't want to, like, extend it if you don't need to, you know? But people do it for money. The same reason oh, yeah. the sequels for movies get made. You know, that's why we still get fucking Transformer movies. Yeah, isn't there like the seventh one coming out? or Fifth. Fifth, yeah. But it seems like seven at this point. Yeah. One more question before we go. Who's your favorite superhero? Oh, hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you want, I can either be... You can pick Marvel or DC and then go from there. Uh, can I do one and one? Yes, you okay, can. Okay, okay. And it, it could be a villain, too, so... Okay, so not just superheroes. No, no, no. I was just character. saying character. Okay. Who's your favorite superhero character? Let's see. For DC, uh, 
DC is actually a toss-up. And it's not going to be who you think. Okay. Because, yes, I do like Batman. Yeah. Uh, I've always liked Batman. I've dressed up as Batman <laughs> for Halloween. But there's always been two characters that sort of uh, go along the, the Batman mythos that I've always been more interested in. And that's Mr. Freeze and the Demon Edrigan. Okay. Reason being is that these were both noble people with noble pursuits. Uh, one being like an apprentice, a knight in King Arthur's court, the other one a scientist trying to cure his wife. And it's only through mistake and circumstance that they end up being as cursed as they are. And they've both learned to live with it, but in two different directions. Like, I'd like to think that if another time in another place, Mr. Freeze would probably go the route of good. And I'm sure in another time, another place, um, Jason Black, I think it was, it was it Jason Black? Yeah, I think it's Jason Black. And Edrigan would go the side of evil. Because, I mean, Edrigan's a demon, of course. Yeah. Like it was Merlin's demon. You know, it's different. So whenever I see them in a comic, I always get captivated by them. Because I really don't know what their purpose is, but I know that whatever they're doing, it's in the gray. It's not black and white with them. Uh, as for Marvel, uh, Marvel's a little more simplistic. Uh, I'm a Hulk man. Okay. I'm definitely a Hulk Why? Um, How? Probably because of the layers that comes with the fact that a Hulk is a misunderstood monster. You know, he's, he's not one of these monsters that gets tamed, or uh, he's not one of these uh, ultimate beings, like, say, uh, a Galactus or a Collector or any of these beings. I think Josh Sweden did a really good job at, at portraying that. Finally. But yeah. Hulk has always fascinated me because they've done so much with him. They've made him the, the ruler of his own planet. They've made him a villain in the future, almost a godlike creature. Uh, and they've made him just a, a scared, timid person that wants to be left alone and goes off to the desert and doesn't do anything to anybody unless they're trying to take something from him. And I think the Hulk goes through more shit than any other Marvel character. So much to the point that he's probably the most realistic and most relatable to the normal human public. Because he feels so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying he's like emo or anything. No, I, I, I didn't want to say like that, but no, but he, he... It would be funny if he had, like, you know, the hair that's really draped down <laughs> here. The Hawthorne Heights haircut or like that. Just like leave he me ended alone, up being, Mom. like, more of a pale green because he put white makeup on himself. <laughs> the, the black lipstick and the nail polish, but, uh... Hulk wants to die. <laughs> Hulk is in his room listening to Simple Plan, like, all that oh, shit. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I, I would want to see a fucking uh, playlist from Hulk and just be... <laughs> An emo Hulk. That way Radiohead would be on there for some reason. But, uh... Be playing the Black Parade. Yeah. On the <laughs> oh, man. Well, Ryan, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, of course, man. I know it was uh, kind of... Not kind of abrupt, but I was like, hey, let's let's do this. And I know, personally, a few of my friends really wanted to hear... You talk. They loved you in, in Healing Heroes, and I'm sure they'll be excited to get to uh, know you a little bit more. I love them whoever they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Until another time, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, no problem. And uh, Captain Cornelius says, until next time, citizen. Well, guys, thank you for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, I, I know I did. Um, I know we recorded the episode outside, so it might have been a little loud at times. I apologize. Um, but yeah, we really enjoyed talking about, you know, our idols, Robin Williams, Jim Carrey, um, Ryan had a lot of insight about what it is, you know, what, what it takes for actors to do things. And as you could tell, he's very, you know, invested in the role of Captain Cornelius. Like I said, every Friday we will be releasing a new episode of Hero Talk. Um, next week I get to interview another lovable superhero, Ganja Girl who was played by actress Wakande Murray. Um, and we also have a special guest, my buddy Quentin Goodwin. QJ, he goes by Coyote. Um, his rap name is Coyote. Um, but Wakande and I, we discuss, you know, how unique her superpowers are and um, how she kind of dives into more dramatic roles, um, some of her inspirations as well, and then, like, her history and her process 
of what it's like to be an actress. Um, you know, until next time, I really hope you enjoyed this podcast, this second episode of the podcast. I'm Christopher Rangio. This is Hero Talk.